My name is Jake. I work here at Square, not here in the New York office. I actually work remotely. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a short, kind of 10 minute, 10 ish minute uh, talk on 10 tricks for Kotlin. And these are tricks in the sense that there are things that aren't immediately obvious when you're using the language. So, to start with, uh, how many people have ever used the Kotlin language? Or, or, okay, so how many people don't know anything about Kotlin? All right, a few. So thankfully I've prepped uh, the beginning here with uh, a very short introduction. I'm not going to go super deep into uh, all the reasons why you should use Kotlin kind of on a broad scale. They're, um, they can be pretty obvious and there's, a, there's other talks that you can watch that really dive deep into them. But I'm just going to give a quick overview uh, if you're not familiar. The first is that Kotlin actually models nullability in its type system. And so in, when you get a, a field or a method return value, you know whether or not it's going to be null because the type system actually can express this for you through uh, a question mark dependent to the type signature. You also can, a lot of times, get rid of the actual type signature because it can be inferred from uh, whatever is on the right. If we have uh, like what's normally referred to as beans in Java, which is get these getters and setters, Kotlin actually exposes these to you in something called a property, which is basically uh, a getter and setter mixed together. So you can hear that you can see here that uh, instead of having a get name and set name, Kotlin actually just exposes a dot name and we can read and write to that property. There's also a string interpolation. So if I switch the bottom thing, I can actually instead of just concatenating strings, I can move the uh, the variable that I want inside the string and have it automatically concatenated. Uh, and so that's the complex version. If I just want the two string, I can just refer to it as dollar sign user. There's also the notion of read-only uh, variables or properties. And so in this case, uh, this user is a val, which means it can only be, the value can only be written once. And so if we try to actually write another value to it, it's going to give us you know, a red squiggly and failure build versus a var, which is something we can uh, write to multiple times. And this is actually shown in the IDE uh, as a distinction with the underlying. There's also extension methods. So uh, this is something that's sorely missed in Java and why you see a lot of you know, so-called utility classes. In Kotlin, we can actually add methods like the super useful is Tuesday method to the date type. Uh, and we can just call it as if it were a method that we're already on date itself. So we can find out you know, whether in 1970, uh, January 1st was a Tuesday or not. It behaves like any other method. Uh, and it winds up being a static method in the bytecode. So it's, uh, it's actually very fast to invoke. Colin has lambdas. Uh, these lambdas end up materializing into anonymous classes by the, the compiler. And so in this case, I can you know, execute code by just passing a lambda instead of having the boilerplate of defining the anonymous class directly. There's also high order functions. Uh, this basically means a function that can accept a function or a function that can return a function. So in this case, I'm writing a filter on a list. Um, that filter accepts a function that takes item and returns a boolean, and then you can, in the body of this, actually iterate over the list and apply this function. There's no declared like type or anything. You don't have to declare uh, an interface or whatever. We can just declare the fact that it takes a function as a, as a type. There's also something really cool called inline functions. Basically what happens here is if you refer to this function, instead of having to actually call a method at runtime, the implementation of that method is automatically copied into your call site. So you don't pay the cost of uh, actually dispatching to the method. And more importantly, you don't pay the cost of actually allocating the anonymous class for this lambda. Uh, because the implementation of the function got inline, um, you don't actually need this, uh, this predicate altogether. It can just kind of be, be inline. You get it for free. That's something called data classes. Uh, data classes are similar to, if you know about auto value or immutables. Uh, it's just a class that has properties that are uh, read only. And it automatically gives you methods like equals to string and hash code. And in Kotlin, you get something called a copy method, which allows you to change single properties without actually um, referring to all the other ones. So you can change just the first name without actually ever having to like pass along the last name. 
Uh, and so, like I said, uh, that was like a fast two minute introduction. Um, if you want to know more, I actually gave a talk that's a very Android specific introduction to Kotlin. And um, there's been a lot of blog posts and there's lots of materials online. So the rest of this talk is going to kind of be things that are, are interesting about Kotlin that aren't immediately obvious as to why they're useful. And I try really hard to go fast because this is supposed to be a lot of time. Okay, number one. Um, a lot of times when you write a method, you're not sure what's supposed to go in it yet, and so you'll put in like a to-do comment. Uh, you'll see this like if you only know the condition, one condition of a branch, but you don't know what's going to go in the other condition. This is mostly fine, except if you execute this, uh, you know, nothing's going to happen, you might wonder what's wrong. IntelliJ will actually highlight this for you and say, uh, you know, like this is a useless branch, you should get rid of it because there's no actual code inside of it. But really what we're trying to tell that E is that like, you know, we don't know what goes here yet. Where it's even worse is if this function actually needs to return a value. Uh, and in that case, you actually get a compile error under the closing uh, brace because you need to like supply something. And so like a quick workaround is to just, you know, on the throw exception. Uh, and so this is actually fine. Kotlin has this cool thing where you can actually specify comment looking to do as a, it's a built-in method, and what's going to happen is if, if this ever gets tripped, uh, it's going to throw an exception for you automatically. And so it's a way, and it will also show up as a to-do. So like in the comment you see, it shows up as like a blue to-do thing. Uh, this will show up the same in the IDE, but unlike the comment, if you actually try and execute this, it will blow up. And because it's throwing an exception, you don't have to worry about um, actually like returning a value or whatever. Okay, uh, so if we're writing a method, hypothetically a method that just joins a bunch of strings together, uh, you want to be kind of defensive when writing library methods like this. So this is Java, by the way. Uh, we might we might really not do null checks because we don't want to accept nulls. Maybe we have some requirement where you know the separator has to be two characters or more. And so this can get kind of tedious. Uh, you actually can use Guava. Guava is a bunch of static methods for this. You can use like, check out null. Uh, and we can do the same for the, uh, the separator length. But what you'll notice is that, uh, well, you might not notice, is that this actually kind of changed the behavior a little bit. Uh, the exception mes message of this second check is now has to be done eagerly instead of lazily. So ideally, we assume that the separator is like always going to be more than two in the happy case, and this will rarely happen. But now every time you invoke this method, you always have to do this string concatenation, which is slightly unfortunate. If we port this to Kotlin, uh, we don't have to do the null checks anymore, because Kotlin has null ability built into the type system, but we still, still have to do this check. What we actually can do is rewrite it using something built into Kotlin called require. Uh, and what you might notice is that the message on the right now is inside of a lambda. And so basically, we don't have to pay the cost of creating this string every single time unless it's actually going to trip in the exception. Uh, and you'll remember I talked earlier about the fact that there's inline functions. So this is an inline function that uh, you don't actually have to pay materializing this lambda into an anonymous class. Because the require method gets inline, uh, it's semantically equivalent to uh, our original code, but without having to you know, waste in this case, three lines. It's a lot more, lot more terse. So there's a bunch of these for a legal argument exception, a legal state exception, and assertion error. Uh, and there's ones that are very specific to nullability as well. They're all inline functions. So even though they're taking in a lambda for that message, you don't actually pay the cost of having to allocate them in this class. Uh, can we wait till the end? Yeah. So all types in Kotlin have a supertype, similar to Java, all types have a type of object. Uh, in Kotlin, it's actually called any. And the difference is that it doesn't make, Kotlin doesn't make a distinction between primitives and non-primitives. And so it's automatically going to auto box uh, a primitive when it needs to. And whenever it doesn't need to, it will uh, not do the boxing. And so it allows them to have the same supertype. But it turns out that all types in Kotlin also have a subtype, and that subtype is called nothing. And you actually can't make any instances of nothing, and so why, why is it useful? 
The answer is uh, when you have uh, something like this, which if you don't have that might be a little intimidating, but it's basically uh, if the user is null, we want to throw an exception. If it's not null, we want to refer to their name. And so this is an expression, and this expression has to have a type of some kind. The name, we know the type, it's a string. But this throw statement on the right doesn't have a type. It's actually a nothing type. And so because nothing is a subtype of every type, in this case, it's a subtype of string. And so the overall exception, expression now has a type of string, and that means we can actually assign it to the name. This is really useful in the case where uh, it's broken out into a different format, where you might be tempted to actually add code uh, after this throw. And so in this case, because throw is nothing, uh, the compiler can actually infer that any code that comes after something that returns nothing uh, can't actually work. And so in Java, you have to special case that. In Java's, uh, uh, in Java's type system, you have to special case things like throw and return. In Kotlin, throw and return actually just return nothing. And that means nothing can uh, be returned from them, which means any code statements after them will never execute. And this is great because if you write your own code that you know will never return, like a, this is just you know, a loop that's spinning waiting on a socket, I can actually call this method and put a print line after it, and this print line will never ever run, because the only way that this code can exit is if it throws an exception from the socket being just you know, broken down. And in Kotlin, what you can actually do is use this nothing type and declare it as the return type. Return type. Uh, and what's great about that is it will actually make the code that's calling it after uh, calling it after this method will actually now fail in the IDE and you get a compiler because you know that that code can never run. Uh, let is a construct where it just quickly allows you to prevent reading a field multiple times. Um, so Kotlin automatically has this inference where if you do a null check, the field inside that uh, if, if statement will not be null. Let's kind of another way to accomplish this where you read the field once, uh, and then inside that code block, the it, which is like the implicit argument, uh, is automatically the user, and that user is guaranteed not null. In this case, it's super useful because if the variable is actually uh, a var, which means it can be written multiple times, you only read that var once, and then you determine whether or not it's null, uh, and then everything inside that code block can then refer to the user without having to like explicitly store it in a local variable. Also super useful if you have like a volatile field. This allows you to read the volatile once, again, without explicitly storing a local variable. You can even name the argument of the lambda the same as the field uh, and just treat everything inside of it uh, like it was reading the volatile, but it's actually only being read once. There's also two other methods. Uh, one's called apply. And uh, apply basically acts as an extension function. So when you're inside this code block, uh, instead of calling like user dot whatever, you can actually just call methods as if you were on the user object directly. And then there's another one called run, uh, which is similar, except it allows you to uh, return a different value. So if, this, if you want to store the result in the field, um, you really just kind of have to like type these and then command B into them and, and kind of see what their signature is in order to know the different ways that they're useful. Uh, another super useful way is if you're calling a method, you, instead of like having to call the method and store local, you can just use let to uh, call the method and then propagate the return type so it can be used multiple times. Uh, Multi-line string literals. So Kotlin, uh, when, normally when you're writing a string that's multiple lines, you have to do something kind of gross, where you actually just like store the new lines directly in a single line, or maybe you break it out like in Java and store them, try and store them vertically, but you still have to propagate the new lines. Kotlin actually has multi-line strings built in. Uh, so it looks like this, you use triple quotes. So it's going to retain the new lines that end up showing up. The problem is this is kind of like ugly looking. Everything has to be left aligned and look, look kind of weird. It's hard to edit. Uh, so there's two methods that are super useful on multi-line strings. You can actually just indent them all the same direction or the same like distance uh, and call this trim indent method. 
which is automatically going to lop off what whatever the like leftmost indent is. So if you indent it like this, like it's only going to cut it off at foo, and then bar and baz are going to have like spaces before them. There's another cool one which is called trim margin, uh, and for this you put like a little tick mark, uh, and it's basically just going to like lop off all the tick marks, and so it allows you to vertically align them even uh, even though they're uh, in the actual string, they're not. Like and with multi-line strings, you, you still get the type, or you still get the um, the templating effect, so you can still reference variables inside the multi-line string. Okay, um, lazy is a use, like being lazy is a generally useful pattern if you have something computationally expensive. Uh, so in this case, if I have a, a class that has a first name and last name, and I want to do something like print the name, maybe I'm calling this like hundreds of times per second, which I don't know why you would be, but like a pattern that you could do is, well, I'm going to take this and I'm only going to do the computation once and I'm just going to store it into a field. Uh, but this is kind of like error prone and, and ugly boilerplate, and maybe you have two methods, uh, and then you need to copy that twice. Uh, a very kind of topical way that you could solve this would be move these into your object graph and then use Dagger to provide the lazy. But it turns out that Kotlin actually has something built in for this. Uh, and what we can do is actually define the field as having a lazy value. And so basically the first time you access this, it's going to run the computation inside the lambda stored into the value and return it every single time. Uh, and so both this and Dagger use the same technique, which is double check blocking for this. Uh, and if you know that you don't actually need that, Kotlin actually has the advantage here because it allows you to work around. The way that that's done is you actually can specify a um, what's it called? lazy thread safety mode. Uh, and what this is going to allow you to do is actually get rid of the legacy behind. It's going to allow you to get. Uh, <laughs> There we go. Uh, it's going to allow you to get rid of the double check locking. So if you know this is like thread confined, but you still want it to be lazy, uh, you can skip the, the locking, which while on the JVM, you know, uncontended lock is not that expensive. On Android, it's a little more expensive. And so this actually winds up saving uh, some runtime overhead. Not, not doing good on my 10 minutes. Uh, there's like useful functions for all kinds of weird things that you want to do occasionally. So sometimes you just like want to see how long a piece of code takes, and you got to do you know record the time, do the diff, print it out. Turns out that uh, Kotlin actually has a couple built-in functions that do this automatically, uh, and they're inline functions. So again, you don't pay the cost of like the lambda that basically just inlines to the same implementation. So there's one for doing milliseconds, which does system current time millis. Uh, there's one for doing nanoseconds. Which does system .nano time, uh, and these are super useful in the case where you also want to like aggregate different measurements. So instead of like having to store multiple locals or whatever, um, by putting in a lambda, it just like simplifies and much, expresses the intent much more clearly. Okay, um, deprecation levels. So Java has deprecation, Kotlin has deprecation as well. If you want to deprecate our joiner method that we wrote originally. You actually just can't put a deprecated annotation on it. Kotlin forces you to supply a string value, which has a message of some sort. Uh, so this is going to wind up in you know, the Java doc of the method, uh, and the annotation will also end up uh, in the bytecode. What's useful, though, uh, oh yeah, so if you try and use this, it like shows up the same as it would in Java with a little dash one. It turns out that there's also two other methods of deprecation built into Kotlin, which are unique to Kotlin. The first one is called error, uh, and you can supply this to the deprecated annotation. This turns a warning when you use the code into an actual error, and it will actually fail your build uh, from actually compiling and saying, you know, don't use this anymore, use string.join, or join to string. The other one's actually hidden. Uh, and this one's super interesting because when you actually try and call a method, well, I'm behind. I don't know why this is lagging behind. So the other one's called hidden. Uh, and when you try and call this method, 
even though it's like perfectly defined and visible, the call site actually pretends like it can't see the method. You might be wondering, like, well, why would you retain the method but deprecate it as hidden? Uh, this is super useful for like binary compatibility. So if you're if you're a library or whatever, and you want to like get people off of your methods, you can go through these like deprecation steps and eventually wind up in hidden where anyone that's compiling against you can no longer reference this method, but any code that's has already compiled against you can still run against your runtime because the method is actually there, it's just no one new can compile against it. There's a second cool feature of deprecation called replacements. Uh, and so what this allows you to do is, again, we're going to go back to the warning, the normal warning version. It allows you to supply a string which is going to serve as the uh, replacement for the code that you have written. So I said I want to use like strings join to string. I can actually supply Kotlin with, you know, whenever someone is using this method, I actually want you to prompt them to replace it with uh, strings join to string. And so you'll notice that like the names inside this string actually line up with the argument names. So strings to strings, uh, set goes to set. And then when I put my cursor on join, down here at the bottom, uh, and I do like an intention action in IntelliJ or Android Studio, it's going to pop up and say, hey, you should replace this with string which joins to string, and all I have to do is press enter, and it's going to actually do the replacement for you. And because those argument names match, it's going to take the arguments that were already there and move them to the positions that you know, I want them to be. Uh, also super useful uh, when combined with error. So when you're like taking, when you're removing someone's ability to call a method, you definitely want to give them like a, a one-stop shop for replacing it. And so this gives you a quick way to do that. Uh, another cool feature of deprecation replacements is that you can actually include, like Guava has a joiner built in, but you have to import a type. And so with uh, these replacements, you can actually specify a series of imports that you want to go along with your replacement. And so if I switch to using uh, Guava's joiner, and I include this import, when I go to my join method and I do the intention action, dramatic pause. Yeah, I mean, if you guess what's going to happen. It does a replacement, retains the arguments, puts them in the correct spot, and then it also automatically adds the import for you. OK, last one. Running a little behind. Uh, so erasure is something that we don't have to deal with too often on Android, but it's it's something that's still present because it's baked into you know the class file format and how uh, how Java erases generic types. So we can't do things like this for implementing two interfaces with a different generic parameter that gets error. Uh, and basically the same thing is if we're trying to write two methods that have uh, arguments which end up erasing to the same type. So list of string, list of int, in the blank code is going to wind up basically both just being lists. And so that's not going to work because those are the same methods, but we actually want them to be different. We want the top one to take strings and the bottom one to take what's supposed to be uh, And so we can do like gross things is you know, we can take this and we can change the method names. Um, but that's like that's not fun. Uh, Kotlin actually has a uh, reifies types in the compiler, not at runtime. And so we can actually leverage that to do something smarter for Kotlin. So if we go back to our original example, which that's supposed to be it, time with the uh, in 1.1 and newer, you can actually specify an annotation JVM name, which is going to be the name of the method that's in the class file. But since Kotlin knows about generic types in the compiler, it actually can differentiate between these two types. And so in Kotlin, you actually can have methods that erase to the same signature. Uh, and so in the class file, it's going to rewrite them to different names. And also, anyone that's interopting from Java is going to see the, the renamed version of these names. But at least when you're in Kotlin, you don't have to deal with, uh, you don't have to deal with like, these weird names just to work around with the problem of erasure. And so I have a bonus, uh, 11th trick, dagger two, very on point for our next presenters. And the only thing I have to say is that it works. That's all I got. Thank you.